Hi, everyone. Since this episode is about Eris Industries, I did want to point out that Brian does work there, although most of you probably already know that. Uh, in order to stay as unbiased as possible, he decided that he wanted to sit this one out, so I'll be doing it with Mayor. Uh, our interest and our desire to interview Eris is in no way influenced by Brian's position there. We are generally fascinated by what they're doing, and as we do every week, uh, we try to bring you the most informative and interesting interviews with uh, people working on fascinating projects and startups in this Bitcoin, blockchain, cryptocurrency space. And this is in no way different than anything we do every other week. So with that, I'd like you to sit back and enjoy the show. This episode of Epicenter Bitcoin is brought to you by Hide.me. Protect yourself against hackers and safeguard your identity online with a first-class VPN. Go to hide.me slash epicenter and sign up for a free account today. Hi, welcome to Epicenter Bitcoin, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and startups driving decentralization and the global cryptocurrency revolution. My name is Sebastian Couture. And I'm Meher Roy. Today we have a very special guest joining in from Eris Industries. Uh, today we'll be talking to Casey Kuhlman, who is the CEO there. Uh, we'll, we'll go through, we'll talk about themes such as smart contracts, business process automation, what Eris is trying to do, etc. But before we start, perhaps it's best we have an introduction from you, Casey. Tell us a bit about your background. Sure, thanks. Uh, my background began... Uh, um... Uh, I'm American, uh, and I, I did uh, a little bit of engineering in a former life, but instead of uh, building things, which I was sort of destined to do, I decided that it might be more interesting if I uh, went the other way, and so I became an infantry officer in the Marine Corps. Um, after that, uh, then I decided uh, instead of um, a very aggressive uh, background, maybe I should uh, go explore the other side and, and became a hippie and a ski bum for uh, quite a while and did a did a decent amount of writing. After that, I decided that uh, being a ski bum might not be uh, the best career choice, so I ended up going to law school. Um, and then instead of uh, doing the big law firm and big corporate firm, which a lot of folks do, I ended up uh, going to Africa and working in the intersection of uh, legal development uh, and, uh, sorry, international development and, and the legal world. So I worked at uh, War Crimes Tribunal for a little while, and then afterwards I uh, was in uh, the West Africa, and uh, sorry, in East Africa, and there I was uh, responsible for running a project for a while, and uh, then I uh, ran my own law firm uh, in the Horn of Africa for quite a few years. After that, I uh, took a job as the head of legal information systems for the U.S. Open Data Institute, and then we founded Eris. Wow, so that's that pretty much spans the spectrum of human activity, right? From engineering to the marine to studying in law school to being a lawyer in Somalia and now to the CEO of Eris Industries. So like when and how did you get interested in this in smart contracts for the first time? Sure. I, I don't actually remember how I stumbled upon it, but uh, it must have been in late January or early February 2014. I was uh, I had been researching for a long time uh, the intersection of law and technology, particularly this idea that we could have computable contracts. Um, and, uh, and so it was in the course of that uh, research that I stumbled upon. At that time, what was just very theoretical, the idea uh, that uh, eventually Ethereum ended up working on and building and so they were they really captured my imagination coming from uh, a legal and tech background uh, which I was in at that time so um, you're uh, you're Brian's boss uh, how's it like working with Brian <laughs> <laughs> I mean I know I, I know how he is working with him as, an, as a colleague but how is he as an employee really <laughs> As an employee, um, he's not my worst employee, um, so that's, uh, uh, no, I, I actually love working with Brian, I must say. Uh, he has a, a super strong conception of what this technology can do, uh, particularly in industrial applications, and he's uh, really helped uh, bring, our, bring ARIS to the next level in a lot of ways. 
I have no doubt. Uh, yeah, no, I was just, I was just joking about that. Um, so yeah, well, let's dive right into Eris. So please uh, describe. I mean, we've, we've had Preston Burn on before. That was quite a while ago, and, and I think things have changed quite a bit since then. Um, can you uh, tell us about Eris? Uh, you know, generally, and what the company is trying to achieve. Sure. Generally, what we're trying to achieve is is to be able to make this tech usable in an industrial setting. And eventually in a governance setting, but uh, we want to start uh, particularly in an industrial setting. The, the most easy way that I can describe uh, ARIS is as a blockchain operating system. So it's a base platform which allows uh, use of various blockchain designs, uh, particularly focused on those which have a smart contract machine uh, in them, but uh, not, not exclusive to that. Uh, and we're, we really open up uh, this technology on a on a on a wider scope than a, a lot of other uh, blockchains uh, companies and so how how has Eris evolved since I guess last year when we had press on I mean back then you had a specific technology stack and it seems to has have evolved since then uh, in fact you were then using ethereum as a consensus mechanism and now you've switched over to Tendermint. Can you talk about some of the changes that Eris has been through since uh, since its inception? Sure. So we've really been always exploring two things. Uh, for those that uh, are, are unfamiliar with the genesis story of Eris Industries, we came out of a bounty uh, in the summer of 2014 uh, when Olivier Janssens was uh, interested in a, a suite of software that could replace a the decision-making processes of a foundation. And at that time, what we there were two technical problems that we really needed to address in order to get at that. Number one was at the smart contract le level of what does a suite of uh, smart contracts that, that uh, work on collective decision-making, what does that look like from an architectural perspective as well as a tactical implementation perspective? So that was one set of challenges which we uh, we're working on at that time and we're still exploring this idea of packages of smart contracts uh, is, is still embedded within the ARIS platform. The other thing that we had been <clears throat> needing to work on at that time and still are uh, chewing on is this idea of being able to merge uh, different distributed protocols and to be able to provide a harmonized interface that one can use uh, at, in a very simple environment such as your web browser. Um, and, and so the ARIS platform uh, has evolved significantly. Um, and one of the things that we've really been, uh, has been our overall design goal, is to build these systems so that they are much, much more modularized. A lot of blockchain uh, designs, in, in our opinion, are very monolithic in how they, uh, in, in the software stack that they're uh, dealing with. And we think that a more Unixy modular approach is uh, is more beneficial. So in the early designs, when Preston was on uh, last, uh, we had a little bit more rigid than we would have liked uh, stack. That, uh, but it it did get at these two ideas of uh, moving uh, information uh, across distributed protocols and or harmonizing information that you get from uh, various distributed protocols, along with uh, working at the at the smart contract level so you mentioned that uh, like one of the two ideas that you were pursuing is uh, you wanted like a harmonized for lack of a better word harmonized user interface to a lot of different distributed protocols like some system where I could basically interact with a lot of different protocols and achieve some goal um, now the, the question is uh, what are the kind of protocols that you're looking to harmonize with and what are the kind of components that you think are needed to achieve this? Great. So one of the, I think that there's two main protocols, which uh, two types of protocols in, in which it's interesting uh, to explore in this area, one of which is a distributed file storage system. And those, uh, you have, there are uh, numerous options for uh, what one might use there. Of course, there's uh, IPF, IPFS, uh, there's BitTorrent and, and uh, other distributed file storage systems uh, that, can, uh, that can be used. On the one hand, on the other hand, you have a 
smart contract and blockchain protocols. And, and for us, those are the two main ones in which we have focused. Uh, others have focused on the peer-to-peer -peer messaging layer as a third major component. Um, and I think that that is uh, viable for, for many applications as well. So can you go into a bit more detail as to what the ARIS stack looks like? What are, what are the different components uh, of the ARIS open source technology stack? So, so ARIS platform is really a, about Docker orchestration. Uh, and uh, we, we feel that Docker has been able to provide a base framework uh, on which uh, a lot of different distributed computing uh, can be built. And so within the components of ARIS, we have uh, the idea first off of, uh, of services. And services are something that you turn on or off in the ARIS platform. Uh, these would typically be if you wanted to, if you needed to connect to a public blockchain uh, or a public blockchain backed service, uh, you can do that uh, with one command in, in the ARIS platform. Uh, and then also we have the idea of ARIS chains, which are sort of our gateway into the relatively complex world of permissionable blockchain designs, um, as well as we have uh, smart contract management functions uh, built in uh, as well as a uh, capability and wrappers around working with IPFS, which uh, we think is, is one of the most exciting uh, file, distributed file storage uh, protocols uh, that's come in the last few years. And, and you mentioned that you have components there and, uh, that, that would allow you to interop uh, interoperate with uh, other blockchains. Um, so we this is a topic that perhaps we'll cover a bit later uh, when we talk about permission blockchains. But um, can you talk about how that works and, and why it could be useful for an ARIS blockchain to interoperate with, say, a, a public blockchain like Bitcoin? Sure. And what specific use cases you might see there? Yeah, interesting. Yeah, so a lot of folks are uh, interested in uh, being able to build process-based logic, uh, which can be then uh, used with a payment system. And so the way that you would interact with that is you would have a, a middleware, uh, which would be uh, capable of talking to both designs uh, via their via their APIs. Um, and then when something happened, uh, either in uh, Bitcoin, where you would set up watchers, for example, someone makes a payment into, uh, into a specific account, uh, then what could happen to the smart contract layer is that then a uh, file could be released to them. I mean, essentially, this is uh, very similar in nature to uh, one of the things that Ethereum has explored with, or well, consensus uh, systems has explored with uh, Ujo music or OG music, I'm not sure. Okay, uh, I, I think another interesting use case would probably be for you know, document notarization where you'd wanna have a public record on the blockchain of, of, of documents or data existing, time stamping basically. Yep, that would be another very valid use case. So uh, when, you, when you started building Eris last year, um, I remember distinctly that you had the approach of trying to build your own blockchain. You had uh, forked Ethereum at that time, and you had this uh, had had a like a blockchain design that you called Heolonius. And over the past year, I've seen that you have kind of moved away from that direction of like building and perfecting your own blockchain design into the direction of uh, using Tendermint and their consensus system as your blockchain design. Now, uh, what was the motivation behind this switch, and uh, how, how did that go? <laughs> uh, the motivation behind uh, the switch, as Ethan once said, was, uh, do we want to rely on 30 geniuses or one genius uh, for, for upstream? And uh, at that time, uh, we had been, uh, Ethereum was a very, very fast moving code base at that time. And, and it was a real challenge for us to maintain a, an upstream project that was being significantly redesigned uh, on a weekly or even monthly basis. 
our goal uh, with what we are trying to do is to be able to bring uh, permissionable uh, smart contract machines to the market. Now, this requires a few different uh, modules when you're looking at building a, a blockchain design. You have, on the one hand, the virtual machine, which is tied to uh, the base blockchain. Uh, then you have the consensus mechanism or module, which, uh, which then uh, makes sure that all of the clients are looking at the same thing. Uh, and then you have the signing component uh, of a blockchain design. And what we've always been interested in is having as much modularity here as possible. Um, and so the, we felt that, uh, number one, the Tendermint uh, uh, consensus mechanism made a lot more sense in a permissionable environment uh, than what Ethereum had been working on at that time, which was just a, a fairly base proof of work uh, algorithm. And when you're in the land of permission blockchains, uh, proof of work does not really make it hardly any sense, uh, not nearly as much as proof of stake uh, does on that uh, on that side. Tendermint is pretty much the fastest and uh, most widely regarded proof of stake uh, 2.0 system we could call them. Uh, and so in that regard, we, we felt it was a good base uh, consensus mechanism. Uh, on that hand, and we also felt that the Ethereum virtual machine had a lot of uh, community support behind it as a virtual machine smart contract interpreter. And so what we've tried to do, and, and I think, you know, we, is to harmonize those two strands. Let's take a short break and talk about Hi.me. Have you ever tried watching streaming TV from abroad? If you have, you've probably been greeted with an annoying error message written by some idiot lawyer telling you that you have no rights and you can't watch this program from outside the country. This used to happen to Sebastian all the time when he was in lonely France trying to watch his favorite moose hockey game in Canada. And you wouldn't believe how angry he got. That's where most of his gray hair comes from. With Hot.me, this painful phase of my life is now over. When I want to watch American television or my favorite moose hockey game from Europe, I just change my IP address and nobody ever knows where I came from. And with gigabit connections, I have zero lag. You can give Hi.me a try with their free plan. Their free plan includes two gigabytes, of data at unthrottled bandwidth. You can use any of their free exit nodes, which are in Amsterdam, in Singapore, and in Montreal. And you can sign up for that at hi.me slash epicenter. Now, if you use our URL, and if you decide to go premium down the line, it's gonna get you 35% off. And the premium plan gives you a lot. It gives you unlimited data. You can use as much as you want. You can connect up to five devices, so your whole household fits on the plan, and you can use any of their exit nodes all over the world, and they've got like 30 of them. And of course, you can pay with Bitcoin. So give it a try. We would like to thank Hi.me for their support of Epson and Bitcoin. So now one of the big differences, like, like you mentioned that proof of work doesn't make sense in a permission context, but proof of stake might. And Ethereum is now also moving into a proof of stake concept. And at the DevCon, I saw that there are many other groups that are wanting to build permission, like, like permission blockchains based on Ethereum's design. Mm -hmm. So, um, so I mean, in the sense that in the future we might have designs that permission blockchains that are based built off of Tendermint, and then we have uh, blockchains that are built off of Casper. And uh, could you explain what, what, what the difference between these two will be in terms of settlement finality or the main, main differentiating factors between these two ideas? Yeah, so the, the main, what everybody is going to, it's seemingly within the smart contract space with their blockchain designs, number one, and, the, and this is an important point to, to bring out, I think, is to move consensus out of, uh, out of process, which means not within the main core blockchain. Uh, client itself. So consensus in uh, in the way that uh, RSDB will be just after the new year, uh, it runs as two separate processes. You have the main RSDB process, which then talks to uh, a Tendermint consensus engine. And the only thing that the Tendermint consensus engine is worried about and concerned with is, is the consensus portion of this. Seemingly, Ethereum will be moving in this direction as well. We see 
that uh, the, and maybe I'm not exactly right, but the delegated witness project coming out of Bitcoin is also exploring some of these ideas. If you look at it from a particular point of view, uh, that's how we see it uh, at least. And so, so if you have blockchain designs which start to move uh, consensus out of uh, where the application stack is, as we call it, uh, then you have uh, you you open up more modularity and options for full. Now, one option will be uh, most likely uh, Casper will be built as its own uh, process engine in, in a very similar design pattern uh, to what we're uh, prototyping and exploring right now uh, with the way that uh, ArisDB and Tendermint will work together. Um, and, and so you'll have two different consensus engines that will both be proof of stake 2.0 um, and both will be very, very interesting. The main difference that we see is that Casper uh, has taken taken uh, certain design decisions, uh, Vitalik and Vlad have taken these design decisions really around this idea uh, of optimizing for public blockchain. So at ETH DevCon, uh, I, I wasn't there, but uh, I'm pretty sure I saw from some of the slides at least uh, they, that Vlad was very clear that this his design choices have been meant, meant for a public blockchain. In other words, uh, he has uh, less, he had, he, Casper comes to finality, but not uh, before blocks are published. And, and so that's something that uh, seemingly makes a lot of sense if you're in the land of public blockchains. If you're in the land of permission blockchains, though, in industrial applications, the last what you don't want to see is a, a little bit of a uh, unknown period. And so in that context, what makes more sense, at least for us and our clients, is that is to move essentially the, the negotiation process among validators to be to during the block creation process rather than uh, ex post when a block is, is published. This is the major, as I see it, this is the major difference between uh, these two protocols. So as as Jay and, Bo and Vlad both admit, uh, Jay favors consistency over uh, availability, uh, and Vlad favors availability over consistency. And what that means essentially is where do we move the validator negotiation process? Is it before or after blocks are propagated throughout the network? Right. Okay. Well, what's interesting here is, is the idea of modularity that you mentioned earlier, where essentially you know, the, the, the database part, the ledger part is completely decoupled from the consensus part. And as more consensus algorithms start to emerge and you know, more ledger technologies, you know, we, we have the ability to construct uh, a system that you know, serves specific business needs based on you know, what these different uh, technologies can offer. So I think it's sort of a... a um, it shows that the technology is sort of maturing in that sense. Would you agree? Yes, 100%. And one of the things that we were really exploring with Thelonious, going back to the very early days of what we open sourced with Eris, was this idea that consensus is a little bit too rigid in current blockchain designs. And we wanted to uh, work on opening up more experimentation there, as well as more optionality there. Because, you know, uh, people argue relentlessly about cons uh, about consensus and, and fair on them uh, for doing that. But, uh, but it's a little bit awkward for a blockchain design uh, to have to go all in on a consensus when you could potentially give some optionality to your users as a blockchain designer. Okay, so let's, let's talk about permission blockchains for, for a little bit. Um, it personally, uh, so I'm, I'm working on this new startup project now called Stratum, which I mentioned before, and uh, we're, we're using permission blockchains to do certain things. So it's, and we're also using you know, the Bitcoin blockchain for, for other types of things. Uh, and one thing that I find very difficult and very challenging is explaining to people what blockchain technologies are and how they're useful without first explaining what Bitcoin is and how Bitcoin sort of changed the way we think about consensus and such. Um, I'd like to get your thoughts on on this, is, is it possible to explain permission blockchains without having to explain Bitcoin? Essentially, it's a question of you know, blockchains without Bitcoin, which people seem to be talking about at this time. And uh, and I guess my follow-up question would be, how are blockchain technologies, permission blockchain technologies, 
useful for industry? Great questions. I spend many of my days answering this question. So how I explain it is generally I do not start uh, necessarily with Bitcoin because when you're in the land of permission blockchains, it's actually a little bit easier to start with traditional data and process management solutions rather than starting at uh, at Bitcoin. So generally, if we're looking at data management and process management solutions, uh, you'll have a, a spectrum which will get set up where on the one hand, you have uh, traditional uh, solutions which are uh, currently uh, maybe distributed, but wholly under the control of one enterprise. And then on the other end, you have fully public, fully decentralized uh, blockchain solutions. And then you have permission blockchains, which are somewhere in the middle. And so I generally start with this idea that what we're really talking about here with permissionable blockchains and smart contract technology is, is business process improvement software. Now, there has been a lot of business process improvement software that has come up over the years. One need really only walk down uh, the terminal of any modern airport uh, to see uh, advertisement after advertisement of enterprise uh, uh, software that is really about business process improvement. But the challenge that that software has had from a strategic point of view is that it cannot really be ran on metal, which is is outside the control of one organization in order to have the verifiability that one wants. And with smart contract technology, what we have for the very first time is an ability to build business process automation software that cuts across different stakeholders. And so that's generally where, where I begin when I'm talking uh, with, with folks. That's uh, very valuable. I, I, I might that, uh, I might use that uh, when I'm explaining the, the blockchains to people. Um, okay, so if we're thinking about business process automation, then um, what is, in your opinion, the greatest value that blockchains can provide, specifically on business process automation? And I guess uh, you know it's the question regarding industry here is what. Uh, how, how can it improve business automation, business process automation when multiple parties are involved in a process? Well, that is the, that's the sweet spot for uh, really blockchain and smart contract technology. I, I is, <laughs> Yeah, exactly. It's, it's also one of the biggest challenges if you're looking to, uh, to, to really enable this within enterprise. So it's a double-edged sword in that sense, and, and we can get to some of those challenges later, uh, hopefully. But the, the, the winner is uh, right now business process automation stops, as I say, at the glass doors of the enterprise. In other words, there is a whole bunch of automation that has happened uh, around business processes, but those uh, processes which are internal to a company have been automated. Now, where uh, if you were talking about multiple stakeholders in a deal, so let us talk about uh, a, a corporate bond scenario, let me say, just to pick a finance use yeah, case. Let's, let's go into an example here, because I think, I think you know, people need to wrap their heads around really what this looks like when you have you know, three or four companies working together and how they can implement this. Yeah, exactly. So when you have a, a corporate bond, for example, uh, you have multiple, generally you'll have multiple banks which are underwriting the bond or initiating the bond one can think of. Uh, and then you will also have multiple parties which will be uh, involved in the administration of the bond. So you have calculation agents, trustees, and other parties uh, involved in the administration of that bond over its lifetime. You also have the bond holders who generally will have uh, some rights and responsibilities uh, about this financial instrument. And finally, you will have uh, the company which issued the bond uh, involved in a scenario. So, so what you're looking at is instantly uh, multiple parties uh, and, and a big range of stakeholders and at various outcomes which might be needed uh, based on what those stakeholders' rights and responsibilities are. The way generally that this works today is that folks uh, are able, internal to each of the underwriting banks, let me say, they're able to 
administer their duties under the term sheet, uh, which are inherent to them, and they're able to audit, sorry, to automate the duties, uh, which are internal to them, uh, and then uh, other the other banks that are underwriting would do similarly, and then there will be a reconciliation process that will be needed uh, between the various stakeholders. And the idea is that uh, that reconciliation process is generally prone, number one, to human error, and number two, it's very slow, because at this point, it's mostly humans that are doing that reconciliation. And so this is one of the areas where you can use blockchain technology to essentially stop making a bunch of API calls, which are really human level API calls uh, between banks, and to stop doing that and everyone just look at the same uh, core data set. And that's what a blockchain in a permission environment is, is able to open up. But I mean, bonds are one area, but there's a whole range. We view this technology as a horizontal. So, uh, so perhaps I could I could go through a different example, and you tell me if if something like this is is makes sense. So, so today uh, today in the world you have a lot of uh, lot of different markets. Like Uber is a market, for example, where people who have uh, taxis who can drive around people need to be matched with people that that want that ride. You have markets like eBay that allow people who want to sell stuff and people want to buy stuff to coordinate. So what happens today is generally like these kinds of markets are formed by one company and there's a lot of automation inside that inside the process of that company itself. So if you imagine a market for let's say old mobiles, then uh, the, the company might create the market and have a lot of automation inside the inside the market itself. But what does not exist is if there's a market uh, that's created by one company and a similar market created by another company, then the users of one of these companies cannot interact with the user of the other company because the automation does not work between companies, right? Like, so if, if yep. there's firm A that creates market A and firm B that creates market B. Lyft and Uber. You, yeah, Lyft and Uber, then the user of service A cannot really interact with another service provider in service B because there's no way the flow of automation can go from company A to company B. And what you're essentially saying is if you have a if you have an architecture where there's a blockchain in the middle and both company A and company B can offload some of their automation onto that blockchain, then perhaps you could have a new kind of architecture where user of company A of service A can actually interact with user of service B or something like that. That's exactly right. We call this participatory architecture. And the big difference here is uh, currently in traditional enterprise software, you have to own the data and you own your data management solution. On, and what we see this technology opening up and we think that this is going to be particularly important for information age organizations which run on a more distributed environment uh, and, and in a more distributed context, we think that the, this paradigm of what I call participatory architecture rather than data ownership is what will really uh, enable information age organizations to be able to succeed moving forward. Yeah, that's 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 like a very very nice argument for the use of use of blockchain technology. That what what you are trying to say is like there's this business processes all around the world and blockchain with blockchains you can make business processes that cut across organizational boundaries now what's also interesting is um, that the permission blockchain industry today has many subsections like Eris is one uh, this digital asset there are a lot of small teams that are trying to make permission blockchains and a lot, a lot of the mind share for business process automation across organizations. If you, if you think of that as an industry vertical, uh, a lot of mind share goes into only one type of process, and that is clearing and settlement. That uh, people think out of the universe of business processes that can be automated using blockchains, they're trying to focus on clearing and settlement between financial institutions. So you have ideas like, uh, what would happen if uh, 
all the banks in a particular country like England would have shared a common blockchain and be able to do different kinds of uh, movements of money on that single blockchain. A lot of focus goes on into just optimizing clearing and settlement for permission blockchain technology. Whereas uh, you have the view that uh, this actually isn't a very interesting use case. Can you shed light on why that is so? Sure. It, there's three reasons um, that uh, that make this a challenge, I think. Number one, it, you have performance challenges uh, with blockchains. So blockchains, uh, as we all know, are generally pretty slow uh, vis-a-vis existing uh, traditional solutions. Um, in the very early days when people were trying to understand what we were saying, when we were the uh, pretty much the first to market with a permissionable blockchain design, and people were trying to wrap their minds around it, they would constantly uh, love to remind us about the fact that blockchains were slow, which we were always and remain uh, very familiar with, and we understand that. So on the one hand, when you're talking, it a little bit depends on the market. I mean, uh, my hesitancy around this use case mostly is limited to high volume markets. I can I can see the use case in, in low volume markets. The second reason is when you're looking to embed an emerging technology solution within a legacy infrastructure and within legacy uh, enterprises or incumbents, you have to man you have to always keep a mind on what is the change management calculus that the industry or enterprise is going to have to go through um, in order to really implement uh, this solution. And, and one of the things that you will be constantly looking at and keeping an eye on is does the benefit actually meet or uh, significantly exceed, in this case, uh, the cost of what the change would be. And when you're talking about infrastructure level software with which blockchains are, uh, then really what you're talking about is ripping out a significant portion of a bank's infrastructure. And in order for a board, the board of a bank to approve such a drastic change, they have to see a massive, massive opportunity opening up. And what we're looking at in most clearing and settlement markets is maybe a marginal improvement over what we currently have. But I am skeptical and I have yet to see a study that shows that there is a, a a significant amount that can be gained from doing pure clearing and settlement on a blockchain, uh, which is which is not just simply iterative over what we uh, currently have, um, and and maybe that will come in, in the uh, short time. Uh, later, I'm not sure. The third reason that I think this is a real challenge uh, is because of, if we're talking about these types of markets, you number one have to onboard an entire industry, which is always much, much, much more difficult than onboarding a single enterprise, number one. And number two, you have a massive challenge around privacy. And as I always say, blockchains are transparency machines, and they're really, really awful at uh, at, trans, uh, at privacy because of that, uh, different sides of the same coin. And so if you have a challenge around privacy, uh, that really gets at uh, and brings down even the potential benefits that one might have. Uh, touching on this uh, issue of privacy, this is something actually that Mayor, uh, I think you may have told me about one time or opened my mind to this idea of permission blockchains being really bad at privacy, which I, I hadn't th thought of before. Um, and, uh, you know, so the, if you have a, if you have a blockchain that's behind a firewall, you're trusting your, you know, least or the most malicious, uh, node to not reveal the data, which is inside that firewall blockchain. So essentially if you have maybe like, uh, a hundred different, um, nodes controlled by say a hundred different organizations, one of those could go rogue and publish some private data, uh, and you can't do anything about it. What? How can we address this? Is this something that really is really important to uh, the development of the blockchain space? And is it perhaps a barrier? What are your thoughts on that? I think it's 
I think it's much more important in a public blockchain context than in a permission blockchain context because in the permission blockchain context, as you just said, you have a you have other options um, and they're not perfect options. Uh, but for us, we we think that when you're using blockchains appropriately, uh, you sh should be on the transparency end of the spectrum. Um, and uh, for us, at least, this is where we see. So we like to leverage the advantages rather than trying to hedge against the disadvantages. And a lot of that depends on how do you describe uh and how do you implement this technology? For example, if you implement a single uh, bond as its own permission blockchain, and you have everybody onboarded, uh, which is supposed to be onboarded uh, uh, with respect to all the various stakeholders, then you actually want to have full transparency there within that particular blockchain. If you think of uh, the fact that we're going to have all blockchain, uh, sorry, all bonds in the world are all going to be on a single blockchain, that challenges this notion of who needs to be able to see what in a much more drastic way than if you say we're going to do one bond per blockchain. So it's it, it, it sort of the lens in which one looks at this technology uh, it differs. Today's magic word is software, S-O-F-T-W-A-R-E. Head over to letstalkbitcoin.com to sign in, enter the magic word, and claim your part of the list reward. So, like coming back to the topic of clearing and settlement, that was a pretty interesting answer. So, what you're essentially saying is, uh, if you if you consider this scenario where, like, let's say, the, uh, a lot of different banks want to implement one blockchain and do some kind of movement of funds like clearing of exchanges and settlement of exchanges on that single blockchain, then there are essentially a, a couple of different problems with that approach. The first is transaction throughput and scalability, which which is, is a challenge today, but which may um, which may, may, may even be solved in the future. The the second thing that you mentioned was um, uh, was the calculus of cost which means if you want to change the whole uh, financial infrastructure of let's say a nation that's a lot of lot of uh, cost to it and what what exactly is the benefit that is that is that is unclear today third thing you pointed out was was the privacy aspect right um, that once you have a blockchain for financial transactions it at that scale it might need to be public and these are transparency machines not privacy machines so is that a good summary of your answer? Yep. Yeah, so let, let, let's move on to smart contracts. Um, so similarly to you know, blockchains and the question I, I asked earlier about how you explain blockchains to industry professionals, how do you approach the question of smart contracts with clients or people that you might talk to at conferences, things like that? Exactly the same way. I mean. Generally, I lump the two together. I, for us, I mean, the the idea of a blockchain alone doesn't really give anybody anything. I mean, essentially, you need to have some suite of uh, automation on top of it in order to have any benefit within industry. It, sorry, that that was a bit uh, that was a bit uh, exaggerated. Uh, Certainly in uh, the land of public blockchains, uh, Bitcoin specifically, yes, you have uh, definitely some value there. I'm not trying to say that. But in an industrial application uh, where most industries and most uh, enterprises that we have talked to, they don't have a challenge around uh, tracking who owns what when. To the extent that there was a challenge there, and perhaps there's some very interesting applications of only that question within an in within a insurance context. Uh, but outside of uh, that, uh, really, what you need to focus on is what is the blockchain doing for me, um, and 
To get there, generally you're talking about what is the virtual machine that is tied to the blockchain, uh, whether that is a Ethereum style virtual machine on which you can deploy smart contracts or whether that is a more uh, shrink wrapped solution, which uh, some of our competitors uh, build and, and they prefer to take that style. For us, we think that uh, a virtual machine uh, which has, uh, has some capabilities to run scripts is a very powerful uh, start uh, for beginning uh, to look at this technology. We think down the road uh, that you could probably kind of lock down solutions for particular business problems uh, and you might be able to get away from this idea of using uh, an Ethereum virtual machine style of blockchain uh, because you would have much more clear ideas as to what were what were all the steps that need to be uh, taken within a particular business process. But at this point in time, there's a ton of negotiation that is happening uh, within industry as far as how do we track financial objects? How do we uh, properly parameterize and then build interfaces for financial objects uh, which are dealt with at a blockchain layer. You also have a lot of challenges around what does this stuff even look like? And so I think it's a little bit early to optimize, for us at least, it's a little bit too early to optimize and try to lock down uh, into shrink wrap solutions. Uh, so we prefer uh, to tend towards the virtual machine style blockchain design at, at least at this point. And, and so, but really Really, how do I explain uh, smart contracts? I start with the business process improvement uh, a line, which which we talked about before, because I, I view these things uh, together uh, as kind of merged at the hip. Well, I, I guess it, it just uh, sort of goes. To, it, it follows the same logic of modularization that you spoke about earlier, and you know we could think of. Bitcoin as one of these lockdown solutions where you have the database and also the business logic and the consensus locked into one. So the business logic would be the smart contract, the database is the ledger, and the consensus mechanisms is proof of work. And so what you're saying is that um, when you explain to people what a, what, a, what a smart contract is, it's simply the business logic part, the, the, the virtual machine uh, code execution part of what will essentially... Uh, process data and put it into the ledger, which is the database. Yep, yeah. exactly. That's a really interesting way to look at it. I mean, I mean, of course, when we think of blockchains, we look at it this way, but to explain it this way to, 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 to people, potential partners, it, it really shifts your thinking, especially when you've been in Bitcoin so long and you know you think of Bitcoin as a currency and then also all of a sudden you have this smart contract thing that comes up and you try, you somewhat tied to this idea of a decentralized currency and you know all the ideas of bitcoin and to think about it simply as like software and like business logic and database and you know and then the idea of consensus uh, it's an interesting thought experiment that's not always that easy to come to when you come from the bitcoin space yeah i think that's exactly right when you're coming from a bitcoin perspective uh it does it break down things a lot and we have uh, we we we're our company is not the most popular company on our Bitcoin, let me say. And uh, I think a lot of that is because of uh, challenges around how to explain uh, where we are coming from and our perspective to somebody that has uh, taken that background and, and has uh, for the last X months, however many that is and how long they've been in Bitcoin would be obviously person specific. But uh, during that time, uh, they have sort of embedded this idea of what a blockchain is and collated it, uh, uh, sorry, um, not collated, <laughs> but uh, merged it with Bitcoin as an application. And so we, we view the blockchain as, as the core base technology and we view Bitcoin and its blockchain as an application that is built using all of these components, which we just talked about. But to be able to uh, um, pull those apart a little bit uh, for folks is uh, has been a little bit of a challenge for folks that are coming from the Bitcoin side. For folks that are coming from the enterprise side, uh, it, it makes it a whole lot more approachable than starting all the way at Bitcoin and then having to beat down some of those uh, ideas of Bitcoin to get at where the raw technology is, uh, which is for us somewhere in the middle, how we, how we implement solutions. So, uh, so Casey, uh, perhaps you are the perfect person to ask this question because you have been a lawyer. So, um, we have the idea of a, of a smart contract, 
and in certain certain cases we do see that smart contracts can be a, a, a replacement for a traditional legal contract or um, let's say we could say that smart contracts are a subset of of, of legal contracts so uh, so the so the so the question is um, is this is this correct do you think smart contracts are legal contracts and how do you if if in a situation you have a conflict between the results of a smart contract and a legal contract how would the legal system handle cases like that great i love answering this question um, generally what you're looking at here is uh, two different things. So if we say a legal contract, let us uh, interpret that for the course of this discussion as a PDF or a, a piece of paper which you can take into a court and a court will not have a problem interpreting what it is. It won't look at you like you're crazy. It will say, oh yeah, this is a contract. I know how what to do with this. And let's call those legal contracts for the scope of this discussion. Uh, you also have smart contracts, which for us and uh, are, are simply scripts that are saved onto a blockchain. They, ne they don't necessarily have anything to do uh, with the legal system, despite the fact that they're called contracts, by default. But what's interesting about this technology is not what smart contracts are able to do and how they are structured by default. It's what you can actually do with them. So let's take the uh, idea that uh, you can build a smart contract so that it can fulfill the requirements of a legal contract. So in general, what you have with very, very simple legal contracts is you need to really satisfy uh, three criteria in order for a court to say, yes, you have a contract here. The first criteria is, has there been an uh, offer? Uh, the second criteria is, has there been acceptance? And the third criteria is, is there consideration? So consideration means, uh, am I just giving you the get, a gift or is this a bilateral relationship? In other words, am I giving you something and you're giving me something? Um, and so we do not have a contract, uh, for example, for this taping. You know, I give up my time, uh, and uh, then in response, well, what's the consideration coming back? Well, that's very different from an employment relationship. In an employment relationship, I give Eris my time, and it gives me money. And so there is consideration, which goes back and forth. Now, also, there has been this idea of uh, a contract has been offered uh, by one party and accepted by the other party. Now, you can represent these three ideas without a problem uh, in computer code. There's no challenges from the legal perspective as far as, uh, number one, unwritten contracts. Uh, so uh, since legal systems have existed, uh, people have been able to have strong contracts which have not been written down. This is not something that is new. And generally, contract law is written to avoid too many formalities, uh, with the with the some exceptions depending on what domain you're in. So as you get into more more and more specific domains, there are increasing formalities which need to be required in order for it to for the legal system to be able to interpret an agreement, for example, as a corporate bond, then there are a, a whole range of formalities and uh, necessities which need to be fulfilled by the agreement itself. Now, those most legal systems on earth do not interpret those as specific words on a specific sheet of paper. In, instead, they offer them, uh, they they need to see what is going on here as far as the relationship between the parties. And uh, so since the 80s, for example, in the US, I, sorry, in the, in the 90s, early 90s in the US, we have been able to, we've had an electronic transactions uh, act, which allowed for agreements uh, to be comprised completely in computer code uh, since that time. And those uh, generally have been, the computing requirements have been held in kind of a neutral third party, a clearinghouse, uh, a settlement system, or uh, some sort of escrow party. Uh, and now we have the capabilities not to have that third party, but instead we can do this uh, back and forth as long as we meet the legal requirements for the financial instrument or the agreement that we're trying to do, which are do not mean necessarily specific words on a paper, but yet a mechanism of interaction between the two. 
Now, were you to take today uh, an Ethereum smart contract to a court, you would have a hard time getting a court to enforce that. Uh, so we prefer when we're working with clients to have this idea of dual integration, where on the one hand, you keep your current contract templates as they uh, as they exist, and you add a little clause at the end that says that this agreement is being tracked at a smart contract, which has address X on blockchain ID Y, whatever those the address of that smart contract is and whatever the ID of that particular blockchain is. And so then you what you end up doing is you are able to uh, pull out the self-administering portion of what the contract is doing and you merge that with a document that a court can interpret a, in a predictable manner because what you don't want to have if you're an organization or an enterprise is to start to have unnecessary uh, unpredictable outcomes from a court if you need to go there so do you think that at some point we so right now we still have to rely on sort of this traditional contract model that can reference a smart contract in, on a blockchain do you think there will ever come a day when we can just write contracts in ethereum for example and uh, as long as you know one can prove that this is your private key and that it's linked to your identity through some identity systems that perhaps don't exist yet or government ids that are linked to a private and public key uh, um, system uh, that uh, you know these would potentially stand up in court like how far away do you think we are from that it's not really a function of whether it will stand up in court. It's actually getting predictable outcomes from a judge judiciary, which is not versed in being able to read code. So what it's, there's potentiality here where it would stand, where these things could potentially stand up in court today. Um, there's no, if, as far as I can see, depending on where you are, let's, let's assume that you have, uh, you have accomplished all the legal formalities that you need to do within smart contracts, which are mostly doable. Uh, if you fulfilled those legal requirements, you could take a smart contract to court today uh, because of the way that contract law is written. It's quite loose, but what you won't have, and a court would potentially enforce that contract, but what you don't have is really predictable outcomes on what a court will think that contract is, number one, meant to do, and number two, actually doing. And so that's where it's going to be a real challenge for the next little while, not necessarily around whether a court would enforce it, but how a court would enforce it. So I mean, like like with the how question, what what kind of seems interesting to me is, uh, so let's say like like you mentioned, the two of us are entering a contract and we have a legal contract, and in that legal contract we have an integration with the smart contract. We had a statement that said, okay, part of this logic, part of this contract will be handled by this smart contract ID, this particular ID running on that that blockchain. Now, uh, so we have a legal contract and that's linked to a smart contract running on a blockchain. And when we made the contract, we thought that we had the code right. Now, now it turns out that the code actually had a bug. And uh, the, 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 the code did not perform the way either you wanted or I wanted and it ended up doing something else altogether. Um, now, both of us agree in principle that yeah, we should disregard what the smart contract did and the distribution of funds should happen in a, in a different way. And now we go to court with it. What would happen in a scenario like that? Who, like, can the, can the court actually say that, no, uh, in your legal contract, you link to a smart contract and even if it had, it had its bug, we have to treat that bug as the real thing. Or the, the court says, no, we agree that we should disregard the uh, the results of, of of the smart contract and have a manual exchange of funds on that permission blockchain by the nodes running that permission blockchain. What would what would happen in that case? What wins? Does the smart contract win, or does the underlying legal contract win? 
generally the underlying legal contract is going to win um, in any of these things. A court will, a court will most likely, I mean, it's hard to say I- exactly, but, um, but most likely a, a court would interpret uh, uh, what it knows. So it's going to take the path of least resistance to enforcement here, and most likely the path of least resistance is going to favor uh, that, uh, the legal contract over the smart contract uh, in that context. Now, that said, I mean, it, it, it's very context specific. And these questions, what you're trying to get at, I think, it, are these questions of what we call factual ambiguity. And factual ambiguity are inherently hard questions. Uh, and, uh, and really what you're talking about is the intent of the parties, which are even harder questions to answer uh, within courts. But this is why we have courts and this is why lawyers and judges exist in order to help adjudicate these disputes uh, should they come to this. And, and so uh, hard to say in the abstract uh, and, and, and indeed impossible to say in the abstract. Before the show, Brian, I talked to Brian and uh, and he he requested that I, I specifically ask this question because it seems you have given a lot of thought to this. So what do you think about running governments using smart contracts or in the future converting the entire governance process into a suit of smart contracts running on a blockchain? What would that look like and what would be its impact? Yeah, it's it's quite futuristic for me to think about uh, running entire governments on blockchains, but le- I think it might be a little bit more productive to uh, look a little bit closer because that would be probably generations down the road uh, to run entire blockchains on. on uh, sorry, entire governments on the blockchain, uh, but uh, but. So one of the things that's very interesting to me, and I've worked uh, in this area in the past, is ideas of uh, a budget transparency, uh, where you're looking at, uh, for example, uh, new infrastructure development. So oftentimes the way that this happens is that you'll have multiple public entities which will pool money uh, together and sometimes along with private sector money, not all the time, but depends on what you're building. And those funds, after they're pooled, will be uh, then uh, administered by usually an accountancy firm or audit firm. And what they will end up doing is do wholesale distributions down to three or four or five uh, general contractors who then will do uh, not usually the work but more of the project management. And then they will hire subcontractors and potentially sub-subcontractors that will end up doing the work. So if we're building a new highway, you'll have uh, multiple levels of government which will typically pool their money and then that will be uh, administered by let's say an accounting or audited firm who will then hire a, a, sorry will then do wholesale distributions to uh, large contractors and they will then do subcontracts down and then on the way back up there will be a, a reporting system which will be put in place now that is actually very something that would be very interesting uh, to track uh, in smart contracts because you are able to leverage uh, the notary portion of what a blockchain can do. You're able to leverage the transparency aspects of what the blockchain can do. And you're able to have the modular business process logic which smart contract uh, enabled blockchains can provide for you. And so you get around a lot of the limitations that you have in a purely private sector endeavor such as a a bond chain or whatever for, for, for the United Kingdom. And so I think some of these areas in governance, while they will take a little bit of a, a time to get up and running, will actually be even more powerful than some of the private sector solutions because you're able to leverage the transparency in a positive way rather than to trying to hedge against the privacy limitations uh, which you will be facing on the on the private side. Oh, that's that's a very interesting idea. I uh, I always like to take examples when I get like ideas like that. So when you when when you were describing the idea, the kind of example I got is let's say let's say the Indian government like wants to build a road from the city of Delhi to the city of Mumbai, and now this whole project is going to cost I don't know it's going to cost ten billion dollars to build a super highway from connecting these two cities, and there are lots of stakeholders in this process. There's the government, and now the government doesn't want to build Probably the multiple road state itself. governments. 
मल्टीपल स्टेट का मल्टीपल स्टेट गवर्नमेंट सिटी गवर्नमेंट पीपल हु हैव दी लैंड and the government doesn't want to build the road itself so it's going to announce a tender and somebody is every a lot of people are going to bid like i'll build this for for 10 billion somebody else is i'll build this for 11 billion etc and the government wants to award award this to one of them and then the company that wins the tender won't do the job itself it will have like sub tenders to other smaller players to build small chunks of it or say buy the cement etc so the kind of imagination i got is what if all of the all of these parties were on one blockchain and that blockchain basically handled all of the business logic for a complex project like that and any citizen can go to the blockchain and see what actions what what tenders what bids have already occurred on the system and so there is transparency there is that they that they know that there is no corruption going on in this system so the transparency there has a lot of benefits itself and uh, the business logic like the like the blockchain helps by automating what all of these parties needs to do right would that be a would that be an imagination would that be a nice imagination for what you're saying well ask me that question again in about the middle of next year and it won't be an imagination it'll be built it, it, we're we're already working on this with pretty high level stakeholders it, it, you'll see it pretty soon actually Wow, that that would be really awesome. Cause cause like like in India, the the problem is these types of big projects happen, and transparency is a big issue. Like many people think that the funds are not handled properly, and they want continuous updates on this on on what's going on in, with that project. So something like a blockchain might might really be useful there. We think so. Then the question is, you know, will it be in the government's uh, for, for in India, for for instance, would it be in the government's interest to actually adopt that, and will they? Generally, it is. I mean, this is what you see out of the open data movement: is that there's not there's not a strong constituency within many governments on Earth of of trying to lock uh, down government information coming out. You obviously have minorities of folks that will perhaps be bad actors within the system that won't want information to come out. But across the board, we're seeing with it, with the open data movement generally uh, that public sector actors get this for the most part. I mean, unless we're talking, you know, security services or whatever. Right. So before we wrap up, I'd like to talk about uh, what, what we may, may call blockchain as a service. Uh, we've seen this this this, uh, this term pop up recently. Specifically, uh, Microsoft announced that they would uh, uh, have um, Ethereum, Eris, and IPFS nodes in their Azure store. So Azure, for those who don't know, is sort of the equivalent of uh, AWS at Microsoft. It's their cloud hosting platform. You can easily deploy applications there. And they have, I guess, sort of a store where now you'll be able to go and simply deploy um, Eris uh, nodes there. And this is something that I'm really interested in because at, at Stratum, we're building uh, a stack which will enable people to deploy private blockchains very easily and then with APIs, be able to interact with those blockchains. Um, but the, the question that I'd like to ask you and something that we've been thinking about is you know, if, if as a company, as an organization or a group of companies working together, you, uh, the, you know, the value of blockchain as a service is not having to implement that infrastructure and maintain it yourself, uh, if, as an organization, you delegate that to a company like, say, Stratum, or could be anyone else for, for that matter, Microsoft, then do you not lose the value of controlling your own data? And in that case, if the solution is that as that organization, you also have nodes that you control yourself, aren't you just coming back to the same problem of maintaining that infrastructure? Yeah, that's a it's a really interesting formulation, and I and I quite like that formulation of the question. It hinges really upon one of system design and what you're trying to accomplish. One of the first things that I would consider is is the blockchain as a service running behind a VPN, and if it is running behind a VPN, uh, where is signing happening? In other words. Uh, 
is signing of things, are the nodes using signing out of process or are they using signing in process? Uh, it, wherever the keys are, that's where the real sort of choke point is. And if you're uploading keys to a cloud provider, then you have to understand that you're uploading keys to a cloud provider and you'll have whatever security arrangements you've built in. And so on the one hand, you have a, a little bit of a tension there between security and usability. And this is not a new tension within blockchain space, of course. This is an old tension within any public key infrastructure type of situation. And perhaps even in all of computer science, it's a, it's a tension. And, and how we see blockchain as a service is, on the one hand, making it much easier to get up and running for prototyping. And then over time, as you need to start locking things down, probably uh, what will be happening is you'll move the keys away uh, to to areas which you control, number one, uh, perhaps that's on a you know a server in your office uh, where you can where you do all the key signing, and the nodes which are running in the cloud, they they simply send an API call when they need to sign something to the computers where you have. Now you have to maintain the, those computers as well, but if you're going towards production and hardening, then you're going to have the operational folks. Uh, uh, who would be responsible for that in any production system. And so you're repurposing them from other solutions onto this type of solution, uh, but you're still gonna have the operational considerations around security in any event. But if you're just trying to get up and, and rolling, then you probably don't care. Well, I think that from my perspective and specifically you know, Stratum, we're, we're not holding any keys and I think we can assume it's a best practice for industry players not to hold keys or at least have some sort of a multi-signature model where you know the the the, the organizations deploying these blockchains would have a signing key and um, perhaps uh, the clients I mean sorry sorry the clients would have a key the key and perhaps the companies deploying these blockchains would have a secondary key as and a multi uh, signature scheme but um, what I was referring to specifically is the the database and consensus um, mechanisms. I guess specifically the database. If if, if you're trusting uh, a, a provider to hold all of the database information in the in the blockchain architecture, and that company disappears, and you don't have the nodes on your end to also replicate that data, and also the smart contract, the business logic layer. If all the business logic layer is implemented at your with your service provider, and that service provider disappears, then you're kind of out of luck there. What you think? How do you how do you see this remedied uh, in in a world where There's multiple service providers? Right. Okay. Yeah. I mean, unless of course uh, that service provider has some sort of proprietary technology that they're also. Uh, adding as a service on top. Yeah, of course, uh, of course. Yeah. And, um, but, but the way that at one of the things that's interesting about blockchain technology is that it scales horizontally. And this is very different from traditional architecture solutions, traditional software architecture, which has scaled vertically much more easy uh, easily. So if you think of a, a giant SQL database, that is meant to scale vertically rather than horizontally. If you think of what blockchains are actually really good at from a data management perspective, one of the things is that it scales horizontally. So essentially you, you fire up a new node on your a different cloud service provider and either you punch through whatever the VPN is, if you're running behind a VPN or firewall, you would have to, you know, integrate that outer layer of security as well. But let's assume that problem away as a fairly solvable problem. And so now you connect into the blockchain network and it downloads the blocks and it syncs back up uh, without a problem uh, on, on the new service provider or on your laptop or whatever, on your grandma's computer if you need it. it, it that's one great thing about blockchains and why I'm not I, I don't see this as a giant tension, at least for us and our users, because you can always spin up new nodes on AWS if you're worried about Microsoft going away. Hmm. I think um, it might be a little bit different in you guys' context, but. Right, I, I think so too. Um, 
I guess my, my last question is before I wrap up, actually, this is Brian's uh, question, which he, he sent it into us uh, before we started the show is, you know, we looked at all of the, all the technology stack ranging from the consensus layer to the database layer to you know, the VM and the applications that will build on top of that. Uh, which, which are you, which ones are you most interested in and um, where you see business opportunities for commoditization uh, with regards to all this you know, technology stack? I think that consensus is, uh, I don't see a lot of business value extraction opportunities at the consensus or the database layer. Um, I also don't see them at the outer virtual machine layer. I, I see them really around uh, what is that business process logic doing. If we think of blockchains in terms of infrastructure level software, very few, uh, very few infrastructure level software has uh, projects have succeeded while being proprietary. In fact, I can't think of a m single major one uh, since uh, since the 90s that has really succeeded. I mean, things that succeeded before that have continued to do well, but that's more inertia rather than new projects coming on board. So I think that the base the base platform layer, however it's conceptualized of, of consensus, uh, of, of a virtual machine or many virtual machines, uh, as well as the base database uh, for how we think of this, the base ledger components. I think all of that will remain, will be open source and, and I believe strongly around that. So if you're in the land of open source, uh, traditionally over the last uh, maybe five, 10 years, there's been two major business opportunities which have come on, one of which is what I call a paper convenience model. Uh, Basically, this is uh, what uh, most continuous integration software does, for example, uh, that I pay uh I pay continuous integration services uh, for to give them uh, so they run things for me, uh, which are more convenient than me uh, running my own continuous integration service. And on the other hand, you have the paper privacy model. Uh, this is, uh, we can think of this as GitHub's business model uh, in that uh, the base GitHub is open and free, it, sorry, is free if your projects are open source, but if you need to have uh, some privacy layer, then you pay for that. Now, how that actually looks in blockchain land it is a little bit of a challenge for me to see exactly. I can really see pay per convenience models uh, develop, and that makes total sense to me. Where uh, you know blockchain technology is a little bit of a challenge uh, to run. It's it's new, it's fast moving, and so there's a. a real business opportunity, I think, around uh, making it easier for four enterprises to get on board it and run with smart contract technology and blockchain technology. And then the other piece is what's happening at that business, at the business process layer. And that is not so, in my mind, does not so clearly need to be open source. In fact, I think there's a strong argument for it to not be open source, but rather to be proprietary. And, and so if uh, you're thinking along more traditional uh, uh, software development lines, so where you keep your uh, uh, your secret sauce secret, uh, I think that's where the real opportunities are. Well, I think that's a great note to end on. We're definitely pushing the limits of uh, of time here with this uh, episode. It was really interesting to talk to you about uh, about permission blockchains, smart contracts, and all these topics, which I personally and I think Mayor as well thinks of all the time. And uh, looking forward to seeing what Eris is going to be releasing and what type of interesting partnerships we'll be talking about in the near future. Thanks for having me on. You're very welcome. And of course, thanks for to our guests for listening. Uh, Epicenter Bitcoin is part of the LTB network. Of course, you can go to letstopbitcoin.com to find their uh, amazing catalog of shows about Bitcoin, cryptocurrencies, blockchain technologies, and all that stuff. Um, you can find you can hear new episodes of Epicenter Bitcoin every Monday. We release them on SoundCloud, iTunes, uh, or whichever podcast app you use to listen to podcasts. You also can watch the videos at youtube.com slash Epicenter Bitcoin. And if you're a loyal listener, you can always send us a, uh, give us a review uh, on iTunes or Stitcher or wherever you want to give us a review. And if you do so, uh, send us an email at show at epicenterbitcoin.com and we will send you a free t-shirt. That's right. And new t-shirts have just been made in Switzerland by... Uh, by Brian. Uh, and of course, you can always send us a tip and the link to uh, our tipping address will be in the show description. So thanks again, and we look forward to being back next week.